with us this morning and give attention to the things we're talking about. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture, and believe it or not, there is no collusion between me and Alex on this particular thought, but we're talking about living the life of a pilgrim. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mountains rise, soon will be our home forever. That's the theme of a pilgrim. Peter wrote to those back in that day and time, his day and time, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and he called them pilgrims. And, and in a way, they really were pilgrims. They had been dispersed, if you notice there that word of the dispersion. They had been dispersed out into different areas and were in those areas for a period of time. The definition, according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, of a pilgrim is the idea of one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there, to be uh, uh, reside there, to be by the side of the natives and a stranger. They are amongst strangers. They are amongst people that they are not necessarily and normally a part of. They sometimes are called sojourners in a strange place. And he says in the New Testament that's a metaphor in reference to heaven being like our native country and that we're down here on this earth sojourning for a period of time. Well, that spells it out really well right there, the theme of what we're talking about. And that's the idea of being a pilgrim. And we're going to talk about what it takes. We've got just about four points this morning to talk to you about what it takes to live like a pilgrim. There's another verse later in 1 Peter, if you'll look with me in chapter 2, where he, he's really saying more than just simply that you are pilgrims, but that what does that mean? He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, see the terminology there, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, will glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, we'll be picking up on these ideas as we come through and coming back to some of these verses and talking about them, but start with me here. The idea of being a pilgrim, that's really not a popular idea as a Christian. It's not a popular way to define the Christian lifestyle to think of it like being a pilgrim on the face of the earth. Uh, a lot of people, and we're guilty of it too sometimes, but a lot of people look at life strictly from a here and now, what benefits me in the here and now proposition. We think from that perspective, and so we're all about what I like, what I enjoy, and what's fun for me, and what's good for me right now, and what makes me happy right now, but not a lot about what affects me eternally. Heaven ceases to be the focus when that gets too corrupted. And, uh, you know, here's, here's the fact. We cannot afford to think of heaven as just a nice place as a consolation prize after this life is over. We're not supposed to deal with it that way. We're not supposed to think, well, that's good. If, if You know, I'll live my life like I want to. I'll enjoy my life. We'll do what we want to do along the way. And if there's heaven at the end, boy, that's a nice consolation prize. That's not the way to look at heaven. If that's all heaven is to you, you've missed it entirely, missed the point. That's not looking at your life as being like that of a pilgrim. Again, back to, to 1 Peter chapter 1, where he says, or chapter 2, where he says at verses 11 and 12, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. You see how he's necessarily forcing that on them. I'm begging you, really he's saying, I'm begging you to think like a sojourner, think like a pilgrim. Uh, the Hebrew writer said something like this. He said, I confess, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims upon the face of the earth. A, a sojourner is a foreigner. A pilgrim is somebody who lives in a foreign land away from their own people. And a stranger is a person of a different culture and language. But you see a commonality in all those three words. All of it is foreigner, foreigner, foreigner. We don't belong to this land is the whole idea behind it. So thinking like a pilgrim involves saying to myself, I really don't belong here. I'm not talking about in church right now. I'm talking about in this world. This isn't my habitation. This isn't my place of residence. I live somewhere else, but I'm here right now 
dealing with certain things that I have to deal with in life. That's pretty difficult to think like that when it seems so natural for us to live our lives right here. But you can see it again in the language of Peter. Listen to how he says this. He doesn't use the word pilgrim. But listen to how he says that If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to everybody's work, so in other words, on the basis that you call God your Father and you know He's your judge and that He will call us all into account, then we need, he's saying, that need to conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. Think, think about that now. Number one, he says, God's your Father. You know He's going to judge you. You know you have to act right in this world in which we live. But he said, every last one of us needs to conduct ourselves during the time of our stay, during the time we live here, during the time. That sounds like vacation language or travel language or something like that. During the time of your stay here upon this earth, while we're here, we have to live with a fearful reverence towards God. Well, that language says we're just here a while. We're not here indefinitely. We're here for a while. We're like traveling through. Listen again as we read over here in, uh, in Psalm 39. I'm going to read verse 4 and 12. Lord, make me to know my end. What is the extent of my days? Listen to this. Let me know how transient I am. I hate to tell you this, but most of the time the word transient is used, it's not a good term. We typically think of it as somebody that's drifting, and they're just passing through, and they're, they're down, you know, you may spot them going, going along the roads and everything, but we call them transients because they don't really have a home. They're just passing through. They're just moving through a community. Sometimes that's bad, but what we understand is he said, you, Lord, help me to know in this life, right here, right now where I am, let me understand I am a transient as far as God is concerned. I'm passing through. Let me know that my days won't be long here. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Don't be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you. I am a sojourner like my father's. A stranger, a sojourner. You can understand now why in the New Testament, Peter, Paul, different ones pick up on that kind of terminology. We're sojourners here. We're transients here. We have to think like that. That's what I mean, thinking like a pilgrim. You know, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, puts this idea in our head. Think about this for a moment. It said, we do not have here, talk about here on this earth, and this has sort of a reference to Jerusalem as well for the Jews. But he says, we do not have here an abiding or a lasting city. Where we're at, and you, you could just turn this around, the house you're in right now, the community you live in right now, this is not an abiding place. We're here, we're here for a while, but we're not here forever. You could live in spend your whole life in Lufkin and die here, but it's not a lasting city. There is a fact that we're passing through again. And again, here comes the word transient in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 18. He's talking about the things you can see and the things you can't see, and he said the things you can't see are the eternal things, but he says these things we see every day, including this church building. The things we see, these are the transient things. They're the passing things. They're the temporary things. Understanding my stay on earth, all that I have right now, all of my possessions, the car I drive, the home I live in, even my family to a certain degree, this is a passing thing. It's not an eternal thing. Those things won't be with us barring possibly our family in eternity, but I'm talking about these physical things won't be with us throughout all eternity. The things that are seen are transit. So when you think that way, 
how does it change? How does it change your heart when I'm thinking everything is temporary? I mean, I told y'all last week, and we'd just gotten off of a trip, okay? We went to this house on a river, and that was all of our family kind of pooled our money and got this house, pretty nice house. And it is built for river life, and there were floods around there, but it's up on stilts like a beach home. And it, it was very nice, and it was a nice place to be, but it wasn't ours, and we were just there for a few days. And so you think of it differently. You think differently about a place you know isn't yours. You're just there for a short time. You don't put down roots for sure. What else is true of the pilgrim life? Well, one of the things is, okay, I'm a citizen of another country. I'm coming to a strange land. I've got to live there amongst them for a while, but I have to fight an influence. So I have to be careful that their influence doesn't lead me to forget about my true home. You know, to get so caught up in the culture that it takes me away from what's really mine and what's really important. And so something else Peter said, in addition to them being sojourners and pilgrims, is it says, I'm asking you on the basis of the fact that that's what you are as sojourners and pilgrims, to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. I guess you could kind of, you kind of might could compare this in an idea. Let's say you take a trip to an area that's kind of noted for sinful or worldly or ungodly activities. And you go there, and you, you know, you're out there trying to see the decent sights and, and apply yourself to that. But if you see evil influences out there, you wouldn't want them to affect or war against your soul or try to take you away from the Lord. You, you'd hopefully know better than that. That would suggest that we are not to be at all contaminated by what's around us. He is saying there will be influences around us. There is a war coming against me. I can't allow it to affect me. It will be warring to take my soul while I'm here. But I've got to fight that and not be contaminated by it. We've got two words on that. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the world. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 says, don't love the world. Don't get caught up in all of this. So part of being a pilgrim and understanding what that means is, i got to live in all of this, but I dare not get too terribly caught up in it. And I think that's one of the hardest things in the world to do. When you've got to live here, and yet the Lord's saying, don't get too influenced by all of this. When you've got to every day go to work with people that all this is is theirs. In other words, this is their life. This is all they're about. And I'm trying to be a Christian not loving this world or the things in this world, not trying to be conformed to this world. That, that's sometimes a pretty tough call. Jesus explained it this way. And he prayed about this in John 17. And he prayed... And he says this, verses 14 through 16. He's talking to God, but he's talking about his disciples. I, I have given them your word. So he's speaking to God. God, I have given them your word. And the world hated them for it. Because by obeying your word, that made them different from the world. They hated them. And here's the problem. They're not of the world. I guarantee you, Peter looked just like anybody out there in the world. You couldn't have picked him out of a crowd. If anything, he might have looked a little rougher than most people in the world because he was a fisherman and you know had a, had a pretty hard-working life. But the bottom line is, guys like Peter and John, they weren't of this world anymore, Jesus said. They really didn't belong to it. And Jesus said, the truth is, I'm not of this world. We can understand that a little better with Jesus. Because he did not come from this world. But guys like us, we come from this world. And yet he says, now that we're followers of Jesus, I'm not of this world. Now keep listening to Jesus. He said, this is important. As he prays to God, he said, I'm not asking that you take them out of this world. I'm not asking God that you put them up on a mountaintop, get away from everybody out there in this world, and never have any contact with anybody. I'm not asking that you be, or these people be these kind of people. I'm not asking you to turn them into this. 
All I want is you to keep them from the evil one. So we've got to be in this world, living in this world, not removed from this world, all the while trying to stay out from under the influence of the devil and not letting him conform you to this world. They're not of the world just like I'm not of the world. Christian brother or sister, can you say that? Can you say it this morning in your heart and mind? I'm not of this world. I don't want to be of this world. I want to be of my Lord, and I want to be with Him, and I want the Word of God to make me different from the world. That's something we really have to think in terms of. Look over here in 1 Peter chapter 4. You exactly see what we're talking about. He says here in this text, verses 2 through 3, he said, now, he said, let's live the rest of our time. Now, think about what we read Peter say earlier. He said, you, you're staying here for a while. During your stay here, while you're staying here, you've got to behave a certain way. Now add this in to that. Okay, so the rest of your time here upon this earth, now that you're a Christian, the rest of your time, don't live it for the flesh and the lust of men, but for the will of God. This now he puts this, the time has already passed. In other words, you had time before you became a Christian that you already lived this way. The time is already sufficient, of the time in the past is already sufficient. For you have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. What did Gentiles back then, by and large, not Christian Gentiles, but Gentiles of the world, how did they act? Well, they pursued sensuality. They lived for the flesh. They lived to, to do what they wanted to do and things that satisfied their flesh. They lived, he said, in lust. They lived in drunkenness. They went carousing. They went partying in a sinful sense. They attended drinking parties. They went out there and engaged in all kind of idolatry. That was the life of a Gentile. Everybody knew that. They thought Christians were weird because they didn't do that. But here's the bottom line. As he talks about that, he said, those days are gone for you and me. That's what it's like to live as a Christian now. That's what it's like to live. And it's not so terribly different from what we're reading right there. As a Christian, I have to live a different life. Okay. Another thing, though, to stop and think about when we contemplate this idea of living the pilgrim, pilgrim life is the idea that I have a responsibility to set an example while I am living my life as a Christian. Again, back building on that idea, okay, we recognize I've got a duty. I don't get conformed to this world. It's hard. But you know, here's another side to all of this, and that is, while I'm right here, I've got to be a good representative of who I am. So while I'm living like a pilgrim, I have to be upright, and I have to set a good example to people, and I have to... I have to show them the country I come from, we're different. We live differently from you, and I want to be a good example to you. Here's what I'm talking about. Jesus didn't call you to go live on a mountaintop. He didn't call you to become a recluse. He called you to become a light to this world, a city set on a hill. Your job is not to let me get away from everybody so I don't ever have to have contact with anybody and be corrupted. No, it's just the opposite. And this is, there's a tension here, as I heard it referred to. There's a tension. Here I am, and I can't escape the world. I have to live in the world. I have to be different from the world. And I have to be a good example to the world. And I have to choose not to alienate myself from the world. I mean, all of that's in one ball of, you know, ball of, of wax and God's commands. I've got a job to do while I'm in this world. And you know, in the very language of Jesus, not only can I not be a recluse, can I not hide out in a little corner of my house, he says, what do we do with lights? We put them on lampstands. You don't put them under bushels. You don't put them under baskets. You put them up where people can see. That would suggest that our works are to be seen, not in a showy sense, we have a responsibility to demonstrate to the world how Christians should live. You go back to something we've already read, but look at this again in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where he said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. 
having your conduct honorable, honorable among the Gentiles. So I'm living in the world, and yet I have to be honorable in my ways. I have to show them, in other words, that honorable things. They're going to be observing me, watching what I'm doing. I don't want to be spoken of. They're going to think, I, you know, here's the problem. We've got two strikes against us in this game. They already believe that we're on the wrong side being Christians. They already look down at us for being faithful, positive, upright, God-fearing Christians. Much of the world looks down on that. Don't want to admit that, but it's a reality in our time. It hasn't always necessarily been that way, but most of the history it's been that way. And what ends up happening is they think because you're a Christian that means you're an evildoer. See, that, that's exactly why Peter said that, and that's what they thought in the first century. You're an evildoer because you are a Christian. And he's telling us that, of course, is not true. It's not true, but you have to be so upright that they'll look at you and what they're going to do is they're going to say, they claim those Christians are evildoers. They claim they're bad people, but look at their works. Their works are good. They'll observe those works, and he said maybe there'll come a day, some at least interpret this passage this way, maybe there'll come a day when God will visit their house, that the gospel will come to their house, and they'll glorify God on that day because of you, because they saw you and they knew there's more to being a Christian than this bad rep that people give you. There is a good thing about being a Christian and a faithful thing about being a Christian. This is what I'm talking about in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4. It says, well, they look at you and they think, it's strange. You're strange. You don't run with them. You don't run in their kind of life. You may be with them sometime, but look how Peter puts it. You don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation. That's no terminology we use nowadays, but what he means is think of the world and all of its sinfulness and all of the evil ways that we read about and see sometime practice. Think of that like a flood, okay? How hard is it when the waters of a flood start to move to buck that? You all know a current takes you and it's pushing against you and you can't move. I was trying to talk about this river we were beside. I made the mistake of setting out in it at a bad current spot. And I stepped out. The water wasn't but that high. But I actually hit a point where I said, help, you know. <laughs> I realized I couldn't push against the current anymore. That's a flood. Now dissipation means worldliness, ungodliness, sinfulness, wastefulness of uh, of who you are and what you are as Christians. It's kind of like the prodigal son. It's a dissipated, flooding life of sin. But he said, you won't get in there with them and you won't run the current with them and you won't go where they go. And they said, you're weird. You're strange. You don't go with us. You don't do what we do. They're going to look at you and they're going to believe that and it's going to take all the good works you can do to convince them otherwise that you're really something worthwhile. Fourth thing I wanted you to notice for our lessons through, and it's probably the most obvious of all, and that is to be a pilgrim, you've got to keep in mind the homeland. You can't say, I'm a citizen of earth. Sooner or later, I hope to wind up in heaven. You have to think, I'm a citizen of heaven on my way back home. But I'm in a foreign country right now and I've got to abide there until such a time as I can go back to my home. He said, I didn't even read that back up there. Our citizenship, Paul says, is in heaven. No matter what country you're a citizen of, your citizenship is heaven. Your Lord, your ruler is in heaven. Your Savior is in heaven. Look at the way it's explained here in Hebrews chapter 11. These are one of the most classic of passages about pilgrims and sojourners. Verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, 
he obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Everybody knows the story of Abraham. He got called out of Hagar and Ur of the Chaldees to go into a land. He got called and he didn't even know where he was going, but by faith he lived. He lived in that land of promise, the place we would later call the promised land. He lived in that land as an alien, as in a foreign land. He didn't build a house. He dwelt in tents there with Abraham and um, with Isaac and Jacob. Listen to this. He was looking for a city. A city that has foundations, whose maker, whose architect and builder is God. Let's keep reading. Of those patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, they confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country that's theirs, of their own. Indeed, if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if they were thinking about that country that they came from, that they went out from, well, they could have just gone back. They could have got to that country easily. But as it is, what it's really talking about to say they were exiles is to say that they desired a better country, a heavenly country. Boy, what an introduction to a thought there. To suggest that what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were really seeking was not just one more piece of land, but because of their dedication to God, what they were really seeking was a heavenly relationship with God, a heavenly country. And it it makes this note about it. It says, when somebody thinks that way, now look, this is why it applies to you and me. When we think this way, When we talk this way, he says, God is not ashamed to be called your God. God was not ashamed to be called their God. God has a city prepared for such people. But do you understand, you have to think pilgrim. You have to think, I want to be in that place. I want to go. I consider that my real home and I'd like to go there. And that's the most important citizenship I'll ever hold. If I might go back to a passage I read part of earlier, and this will be our last passage for the morning, Hebrews 13, verse 14. Quoted the first part, we don't have here a lasting or abiding or permanent city. But the follow-up is that, but we're seeking the city which is to come. We're seeking a different place. We're seeking a different destination. We don't think of this as home. You know, really, in those Hebrews passages, what he was trying to encourage them to do, and I find this very ironic in a way, he was trying to encourage them to stop thinking about Jerusalem, 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 how important all that is to you. He was trying to show them you've got a heavenly Jerusalem to think about, not just an earthly one. You know, the Hebrew writer is believed to have written in the 60s A.D., don't know exactly when in there. Maybe after Paul and Peter had died, which would be about 64 A.D., slightly after that. Think about the poignant statement to the Jews to say, that Jerusalem over there, that's not an abiding city. What if you had that epistle in your hand and you read that and you thought, oh yeah, Jerusalem, it'll be here forever. What if you knew that seven years, five years, four years later, that city was wiped off the face of the earth. Why would your reaction have been? What a graphic lesson to suddenly realize that that city which I put all my interest in, that's not an abiding city. We on this earth, we don't think of Jerusalem, but we think of a lot of things. We think about it being an abiding place. But it's not. He said, that's not what we're searching for. We're seeking the city that's to come. The city that's talked about in the book of Revelation that descends out of the heavens, we're seeking that city. So all of these things contribute to understanding what we have to be to be pilgrims. I appreciate your good attention this morning. If you need to obey the gospel and come be baptized into Christ based on your faith, based on your repentance, based on your confession of Christ, we gladly receive you if you need to be restored. 
All of us drift at times from our dedicated journey in remembering where we really belong. The goal of this lesson is to get us all, myself included, to be pilgrim people, to be people that think this way about their lives and have this mindset in them. I ask you now, while we sing the song, if you have a need, please respond at this time. <clears throat>